Hello and welcome to another edition of 41 Files here at 41 Action <laughs> News. We are thrilled to have you with us. Uh, so excited for another edition of this podcast, and it's the last podcast we will record before the Kansas City mayoral election on Tuesday. I we thought leave. you were about to break some news. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> no. The, the only news, it's not breaking news, but this is also a Kansas City Royals first place edition of 41 Files, although uh, the Twins fan in the room was quick to remind me they are tied for first place. That's digital producer Sam Hartle. Hi, Sam. Uh, it's better than being tied for last or, or being zero and zero or Amen. not even having played the game with the weather yesterday. Amen. Yesterday. That's yeah. all true. The other voice you heard there, 41 Action News reporter Stephen Dial. Stephen, hello. Go Braves. Oh, boy. Who Chop. lost yesterday. Chop on. And 41 Action News reporter Kat Reed, also in the building. Kat. Go Cubs, go. Go Cubs, go. Oh, Some wow. singing. <laughs> Man. That's the first on the, on the I like that a whole bunch. So, obviously, we're going to talk a lot about the mayoral election, the primary coming up on Tuesday. And uh, there has been probably no one... Uh, in the building, more involved with covering that particular election than the two reporters here in the room with us right now, Kat Reed and Stephen Dial. Uh, guys, um, there's a lot to get into with this, but I want to make sure and also remind people, you've got some time now between, if you listen to the podcast, we we're recording this on Friday morning. Um, if you listen to that between now and Election Day, you guys have extensive interviews right now on KSHB.com with 10 of the 11 mayoral candidates. Uh, they're each, I mean, they're lengthy. A lot of these, these are not just, you know, five, 10 minute interviews. These are, these are pretty lengthy interviews with all of them uh, where people can go. If they've got one, they would like to learn more about a candidate, or if they've got the time to listen to all 10 of them, that'd be a great resource before the election day, right? You guys put a lot of work into that. Yeah. You know, instead of putting on an episode um, on Netflix, just open your 41 Action News app and perfect. go watch uh, an interview. It's a perfect sale, Kat. <laughs> Walk us through how you guys, how we came up with the idea of, of that project and, and then how long did it take to, I mean, corralling 10, 11 people uh, wasn't an easy task. Um, walk us through how you guys came to, uh, to put that together. Well, it was really, it started with Sam. It was kind of your idea. We had talked about the... No, it was, no, no, it was your idea. It was your idea. It was. You know, it, we, it started as um, the idea of comedians and cars getting coffee, Jerry Seinfeld's it. show. So candidates and cars getting coffee. But with the fact that we had so many to do, the logistics of that were just going to be mm-hmm. a little crazy. Plus, I don't have some cool vintage Porsche to drive people around in. I know my use of Porsche might be controversial mm-hmm. instead of Porsche. It's okay. I have a feeling that Porsche's that's going to come here. up. Um, but so we talked about that, and then wrangling them was extremely difficult because these were, you know, two camera interviews, and so finding the time to do it, you know, it took about an hour each one. So like six, five hours went into just doing the interviews themselves. And Kat did a brunt of the work because, uh, being transparent, we did a blind draw for all the candidates since there are so many candidates. I like that. And um, all of Kat's side um, responded uh, to doing an interview, and um, I kind of got the easy draw because I only did four. So Okay. And we had, again, tell us who the 11th person that would not respond to our interview request. Right? Uh, Vincent Lee, we talked multiple times, um, but we just couldn't get a, a date and a time set up to sit down and hear what uh, he has to say on the issues. He's a very cavalier candidate mm-hmm. uh, who wants to move the airport to Kansas City, which it is currently in Kansas City, and uh, the ballparks downtown. Oh, okay, like to remove the, the Royals and... and- both Royals and Chiefs moving downtown. Mm-hmm. Wow. Right. Okay. So, unfortunately, we don't have a long interview with him, but um, we do have lengthy interviews with the with the remaining ten. Uh, I'm curious how they responded. Compare what is what is it like to do a, a in some of these cases hour long interview with a candidate versus when you catch them after an event and you get a chance to ask a couple of questions. You're surrounded by other reporters. When you have a chance to sit down with them one on one, long form like this, how is it different from your job perspective? Well, I mean, like when you have this many issues to tackle, it. It, it was just a long interview. You were just having to get through a lot, do a lot of heavy lifting. But it was nice when they would throw out an idea and they could really go into the specifics of, of their plan on something. And then we had the liberty to then follow up and ask, you know, how do you envision funding that? And some of those follow up questions that you don't really have time for when you're just running and gunning. And, you know, it's it's hard to do a really issues based conversation when you're d- talking to 11 candidates for just a one story. You know, you go to a forum and you can't really go in depth on anyone if you're trying to cover everyone. And um, I would also say as far as depending on what type of 
uh, consumption you want with us being able to put these interviews on our website and on our YouTube and where you can see the raw conversation, the real, yeah. you know, reaction to follow-up questions or, you know, the non-answer by someone on a follow-up question. I think that gives the voter a little bit more um, education to knowing, do I really like this person? Um, or, you know, we hit on certain topics, specific topics that matter to everyone in the city, whether uh, you live in the city or you work in the city. Um, there were topics that we hit on. So I think being able to just sit down and it's just us talking to them and not a gaggle of reporters or not a, okay, I'll give you 20 seconds and leave yeah. was a lot different. I think that uh, the more politically minded residents of Kansas City, the people who, um, I don't want to say take it more seriously, but the people that put maybe a little bit more thought into the voting process uh, are more likely to be the people that go to the political forums, that kind of thing, and try to figure out, okay, who do I really want to vote for? I'm going to go listen to these people talk. Do you think that if a person were to, hopefully a person that's listening has the time to go and listen to all 10 of your interviews, do you think that serves the same purpose, or is it even better than going to a political forum if they're able to go and listen to all 10 of the people you spoke to, would you say? I think it's better because in a forum, a lot of times they'll say, in one minute, tell us what your plan right. is on crime. And I think the other helpful thing that we did is each story is kind of broken down with headers. So if you really care about one particular issue, say infrastructure, yeah. or um, you care about reducing crime in Kansas City, you can go and you can look at the article and say, I'm going to scroll down and read what they had to say about this. I think that that's a helpful way, maybe a little bit more accessible to people who don't have time time to go to forums and follow everything. And, and to be clear, we asked each candidate the same bucket of yes. questions. Right. So it was it was formatted that way to try and make it not fair necessarily, but as, as, as evenly matched, we'll say, as possible, where everyone was, was dealing with the same kind of rules of, of engagement, so to speak, with these particular interviews. There are several topics that, that you did broach, and you mentioned infrastructure, but that's one. But there's things like, of course, crime in the city, transportation, affordable housing is a huge thing, how they intend to vote on pre-K, which has been the mayor's big push as he finishes up his time in office. Uh, and then you also talked to them about differences from the current mayor, because Mayor James has been there for two terms now, so there's lots of things to kind of differentiate yourself. Kat, uh, you did six of these out of the ten. Mm -hmm. um, any of those topics we can talk about. Infrastructure, crime, what, what stood out to you on some of these situations that uh, the candidates really kind of took a stand on? Any of these big issues where they said, this is kind of my thing. This is where I'm circling it. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think a lot of um, candidates, I think two of the biggest, well, I'll go with maybe three of the biggest issues are probably affordable housing tied in with the use of incentives, um, the issue of violence in Kansas City, and then infrastructure. Specifically, we're talking about road maintenance, the potholes. And I think that some people, I think all of the candidates are talking about these things extensively, but some candidates have kind of planted their flag and said, like, this is going to be my issue. I, I would say that Alicia Kennedy is really focused on the use of incentives, and she's really focused on crime reduction in Kansas City. She was an assistant prosecuting attorney in Jackson County previously, so she really drew on her experience. She said that'd be her main focus. Meanwhile, Councilman Quentin Lucas has also really focused on criminal justice reform. He's planted his flag there in affordable housing because he was the chair of that committee. Um, you look at Steve Miller. He's really putting all of his chips in the infrastructure a pile really pushing pothole repairs and even, you know, donned a helmet and a vest and like fixed a pothole on his own. So he's focused on that. Um, mm -hmm. I think that I'm trying to think because there have been so many interviews. Phil sure. Glenn has also really focused on affordable housing because that's what he does in the private sector currently. That's mm -hmm. what his job is. So I think that he's honed in on that issue. And I'm sorry if this was overwhelming to hear me rattle off. This no, it's list not at all. That's what, okay. we're, that's what we're trying to figure out. And I want to ask you both too about this because I think one one of the things that most, even the most casual voters, know about this particular race is that. Most of the people running currently sit on the city council. There are several city council people that are running for this particular office. Did you get a sense of real difference between the people who are on the council now and those candidates who do not sit on the city council? Does it feel like a different kind of interview when you're talking to a council member? I mean, I, yeah, I think it's different just because, um, you know, uh, one, the city council members, they, you know, they know the behind the scenes. They know stuff that we don't even know as far as how the sausage is made. And so they're coming from a different perspective than an outsider also 
the members that uh, the candidates that are running that aren't on council uh, kind of have less to lose um, as far as they can say some more kind of risky things if if that has happened um, in any of these forms or just in mailers or whatnot. But council members, a lot of them are term limited. So it's either this or or, or I'm done. go back to my job as a yeah. lawyer or whatever. <laughs> so um, I think there is a difference just from the sake of a lot of these council members are two-term council members or have had a wealth of knowledge in public service. And some of the other ones, the outsiders, non-council members, have also uh, served in different public roles, but is totally different in their perspective maybe of not just giving the city hall type um, answer instead of just a normal person answer at times. Right. I would say also one thing that I heard from someone uh, who's been here longer than I have, the last mayor who came from council directly to become mayor was Mayor Cleaver. Mm-hmm. So it's really? been a while. Right. So that's not an established path that everyone mm-hmm. has been on the council and then become mayor. It's It's been a long time since that's happened. And from my conversation with Councilman Scott Taylor after our sit down, you know, um, I asked him because I, I live in his district and we were in an area that uh, I had never been to, the Red Bridge Shopping Center. Uh, we were talking at Crow's Coffee. And, and I asked him, I said, you know, I know everyone's, you know, I kind of see what everyone's strategy has been throughout this campaign. And I asked him, what was Sly James' strategy? Because Sly was an outsider. Right. Sly was not on council. Not on council. Sly, mm-hmm. and, and he said it was his ground game. He said Sly knocked on more doors than anyone who was running in that race. And that race, I think, had five or, or six candidates in the in the primary. And so it's just interesting to see, uh, we'll see in a couple of days, which approach works best, you know, eight years later. Absolutely. We're talking about Mayor James, like, and we can't help but here to talk about the differences between, because that is one of the things that you broach with all these candidates is to compare themselves to Mayor James as far as where they see themselves being different, maybe some of the similarities. Obviously, he has already come out and endorsed Jolie Justice for this particular race. Um, I, I read one of the quotes there from her interview. Stephen, I think you did Councilwoman Justice, right, that you interviewed her. Part of the interview, I, I think, uh, was talking about one one source, because I also read, off, of course, the Stars uh, endorsement earlier this week mm-hmm. where they... Uh, endorsed Councilwoman Kennedy, right, and Phil Glenn, who are, is running for that. Um, in that particular, they they referenced talking to Jolie Justice, and they asked how she's different from Mayor James, and she said, "Have you met Sly?" Was that was that was her response <laughs> to that? But how what what were some of the things that stuck out to you in all in all ten of these interviews? Some of the big ones that stuck out to you as far as how they answered that question of how they're different than Mayor James. Well, Mayor James is a very unique leader, and I think it is well publicized. Sly does uh, does not hold back how he feels. He does not, right. you know. Parks words. If he if he's upset, he'll show you. If he's happy, he's he'll tell you. Um, I think just from me talking to the candidates that I talked to, and just candidates in general, um, I think a lot of them are trying to come across as, oh, I can work with other people, even if I don't agree with you. I'll listen to you and hear you out. Towards the end of his term, Mayor James kind of started to sound like that grumpy old man um, as far as... Is bully too strong a term politically for Mayor James? I've heard it used. Mm -hmm. I've heard it used before. And so I think it's like uh, a lot of people don't want that taste in some voters' mouths. And so from what I've heard from people in their campaign speeches, it's more of a, I'm willing to work with the other side and, you know, I'll, you know, I'm going to be tough on certain issues and make sure that we're spending your money wisely. So when it comes to being different than Sly, I think it's more of a... Uh, in front of the camera type stance and not necessarily a behind closed door stance. I think it's interesting. Everyone said that they would be more collaborative than Mayor James, Um, especially you heard that from outsiders, but especially people who are on council, you felt some of the resentment there about Mm -hmm. the way things have gone down, especially in the past term. You look at the airport. I think that's the biggest issue where we've seen this divisiveness. But I think you also have to look at um, how you would feel at the end of your second term, I think that we've seen him maybe get a little bit frustrated yeah. at times. And so we're seeing him at, towards the end of his time dealing with the council. And, you know, he's brought up a lot of times that it's everyone's running for mayor. And it, it just does add a different mm-hmm. dynamic to a city council when you have a lot of people running for mayor. And I think Absolutely. that he's um, I think he's just been frustrated a lot of times. Yeah. How do the people, that, the candidates that you talk to, how do they square up? OK, they want to be more collaborative. But then if you look at the things that Mayor James accomplished during his two terms, he got a lot of stuff done. And in in a city where that's not always doable, is this the, the type of leadership that the city has to have in order to get this kind of stuff done? 
Well, you have to have someone that's just not going to lay down and yeah. and be run over, um, especially when the way that the Kansas City mayor is set up is a weak mayor system. He's just one vote. Well, right. He he is a he or she will be a you know a strong voice. They'll have a platform. Of course, they'll have more eyes on them, but they are just one vote. And so to circle back, I mean, I think all of the candidates are probably trying to pick and choose where they want to plant their flag and where they'll say, well, I'm not going to budge on affordable housing. But, you know, if there's an incentive that is worthwhile, you know, even though I'm critical of incentives, I'll do it. And I think that is what we've been seeing from the conversations with the candidates. I want to switch to pre-K because you mentioned that his his strong voice or that that role having a strong voice and and Mayor James has absolutely used that voice the last few months of his of his term now pushing through this program getting it on the ballot that will be another thing that Kansas City voters get a chance to vote on on Tuesday. Uh, different candidates have come out different ways about it. I've heard I think you said one of the candidates told you if it passes I'll support it but I don't support it as it stands right now. Um, give us just a brief rundown on all the people you talked to where they are on, on this pre-K initiative. Every single candidate I spoke with is not supporting the really? pre-K initiative. In fact, the only candidate who is supporting it is Councilwoman Jolie Justice. And with a little pushing, and uh, Scott Taylor said just because he served on the school board in the right. center school district, if it, he'll vote for it just because he wants to support education. But he wasn't really, I like this. Jolie said she was convinced to like this. And in her opinion, it has a 10 year, you know, sunset. So if it's not working after 10 years, OK, we can move on. Why are they supporting it? these people running for mayor? So I think it's a couple things. I think one, you know, if you wanted to if you want to make yourself different from the mayor's, mm-hmm. you know, favored chosen one, this is one way to, to stand out. Sure. Of course, it's not really making anyone stand out because they're all against it. But I think also you saw all of the superintendents come out against this. And so a lot of folks wanted to be on the same side as the school districts. And I think a lot of people said, you know, I'm not an expert on education and these are the people who are teaching our children. Right. And so if they think this isn't the right way to do it, then, you know, I'm going to talk to them. And a lot of people just took issue with the fact that it's a sales tax. They said that the sales tax should really, that's something that should be used for more economic development, infrastructure fixes, um, things of that nature. And a mill levy is really the way that you're supposed to do things Mm -hmm. for education. So I think it was just the mechanism. And to be clear, everyone I spoke with thinks pre-K, universal pre-K is a a wonderful, good Mm -hmm. good, good thing and that it should be something we do in Kansas City, but they disagree on the mechanism of how it's being pushed right now. And I think you bring up a great point that to the average voter, who doesn't necessarily get down in the weeds in it like Mm -hmm. you're talking about, when you've got on one side the mayor pushing for it and on the other side practically every superintendent or educational-based person saying, "Uh, I don't think so, to the average voter, I think that feels like a pretty easy decision to make unless they're super politically inclined towards that uh, politician or in this case the mayor pushing that initiative. Or if, and I think this is the only hope for what Sly is hoping, um, is Sly is hoping that voters will say, Well, school board people, uh, you know, superintendents, they are, you know, not elected, but hired talking heads. Right. Um, Council members, oh, everyone's running and they're upset with me. But voters, you know, what do you want? It's not about what these group of, what, 15, 20 people say is what you want. And I think that's what Sly is banking on of, okay, just because the school districts say we're not for it. Well, a lot of voters don't agree with what some of the school districts are doing um, when it comes to education. So um, do I think it passes? I don't. But I think that's the strategy that Mayor James has right now. I am starting to believe, I think that it may pass because I think if you look at the history, Kansas Cityans have continually um, approved these renewals of sales taxes. Mm-hmm. The most all of the elections since I've been here, people have given a big thumbs up to sales taxes or that is new taxes. though. That is a that new, is a new right. thing. Right. Mm-hmm. But but they've been doing that, and I think when it comes down to it, when people go to the polls and they're sitting there and they're looking at their ballot, they're going to say, "Do I think that kids should have pre K?" Yes. Mm-hmm. Are there some issues with the system? Maybe, but they'll figure out the kinks. I can see a lot of people having that internal conversation with themselves in the ballot and, and voting yes on it. Well, and some of the the candidate profiles that I edited, even if the candidate said that they are not in support of it, they would they 
mm-hmm. kind of also added that if the measure does pass, that they would support the implementation of it uh, to make sure that it went through. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, a lot of people, I mean, that's kind of the canned political answer of, yeah. I don't support it, but if we have it, you know. If I'm, I'm elected mayor, it. I'm not going right. to tear it down, that kind of right. thing that's just that's been voted in. Right. I want to talk about two more topics that are pretty closely entwined, I think, uh, in a lot of these interviews, and that's violence and housing, uh, because that's a situation that a lot of the candidates have have kind of drawn either a thin line or a thick line between. Um, some have made it large portions of their campaign, and I'm, I'm the housing candidate, that kind of thing. Where do you see them drawing those lines between those two, the violence in Kansas City, which I think is a top-of-mind issue for most every voter in the city, no matter where you live, and then the housing part, which may not affect every voter in the city, but it can be tied pretty closely to something that does. Yeah. So I interviewed Phil Glenn, who his job, he works in the private sector on affordable housing specifically. So bringing together private investors and leveraging public funds to make these projects a reality. And his, in his interview, he said, you know, the reason why we're seeing this violence is because of our economy and because of it's a lack of affordable housing. It's a lack of quality jobs. All of these things are creating the violence that we see. So he's drawing a very thick line and really his anti-violence, his anti-crime plan is his housing plan and is workforce training. So he really leaned in on that. You look at Councilman Quinton Lucas, who's chaired the housing committee it's become another central issue for him. Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't so much in our conversation talk about that in the context of violence. He kind of talked about them separately, but as equally big priorities for him. He talked a lot about the Affordable Housing Trust Fund that council is still kind of tra- trying to figure out how to fund and some ideas to to get that going. Um, Steve Miller, in his uh, in his plan, anti-violence, he talked a lot about leveraging neighborhood leaders, creating these block captains who would work with police, uh, so some community initiatives. And then one thing that stood out, Alicia Kennedy really was the only candidate I spoke to who flat out said, I, I don't think we necessarily need more officers. I think a lot of people say, okay, I think we need to like get staffing up or we need to look at patrol staffing. And she said... If this was the analogy she used, if there were all these fires in Kansas City, tons of fires, we wouldn't hire more firemen. We'd go, we'd try and figure out why all of the fires were starting in the first place. And so she said, we we need to invest more in the causes of what's causing this and um, not just keep adding to staffing. And for the candidates that I talked to, um, of course, a lot of candidates have been talking about crime. Uh, You have Jermaine Reed, which is in the third district and um Multiple people saying, Scott Taylor, Joe Lee saying, yes, we need more officers. KCPD has about 1,300 officers. And from talking with some uh, some people in the police community, uh, they say a, a good staffing would be 1,500. And I know that's a lot of officers in the new budget. They, they're going to hire 12 more officers with some additional funding. Uh, Joe Lee and Scott Taylor were really keen on pushing the fact that Oh, we well, we just put social workers in every uh, patrol, which is a, a different approach of uh, community policing. Jermaine Reed talking about needing more community officers that actually live in these communities that can be a part of these communities. Um, we did a safe KC story on that. If you can look, you can find yeah. that on KCHB.com yeah. as well as about the social workers being involved. Right, right. and Taylor, so Taylor Emmons. That's right. Ah. I did that. I did that story. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, it's a lot of uh, approaches, but. Um, I guess with Kat saying, Kennedy saying, you know, that's not the solution. A lot of these candidates are saying the same things. And it's a matter of what's that one thing that you care about that you say, okay, this person is different on this. And one person I forgot to mention, because when you've interviewed six, you kind of get <laughs> yeah, lost. Yeah, they, they run together, the I'm sure. Um, Scott Wagner talked a lot about the importance of mentoring. So KCPS had mentioned they're looking, there's a huge waiting list for mentors. And so he said one of the things that needs to happen is people need to get involved with young people in our community, right. regardless of who you are. So that was one of his kind of big pushes. But yeah, I think there are similarities amongst a lot of the candidates, and I think that's what what has made it so difficult for voters yeah. to try and narrow down, figure out who they're going to vote for, and because the average person might not have time to go to the forums sure. and to do these things, and there are a lot of candidates. It took <laughs> us a long time to do the interviews, to log them, to write the web stories. Sure. 
I, I want to circle back to the Stars endorsement because that just came out this last week and you talked about informing people on how they're going to vote. That obviously is a huge step towards that and that what a lot of people will base their decision on, or at least many voters will, will weigh into it pretty heavily. Um, that came out this last uh, this last week, uh, Alicia Kennedy and Phil Glenn being endorsed by the Kansas City Star. How do you guys, and I know a lot of your interviews, or probably most of them were done before that endorsement came out, but from your lay of the land politically, how do you feel like that endorsement fell into this election? What was the response to that particular, those those two being endorsed by the star? I'll, I'll let Kat answer first. Okay, I think that a lot of people were surprised. I think that a lot of people liked the endorsement because it was kind of let's shake things up. It was not just, right. you know, the kind of the traditional who who they would typically endorse, I guess I would say. Um I think that it makes a difference. I don't think that endorsements make a huge difference in partisan elections. I think that they do make a difference in nonpartisan elections. When you're talking about 11 people and you're someone who hasn't had the time to do all the research, um, you know that the star has. And so you're like, well, it's nonpartisan. I don't know a ton, but like they seem to believe in these two people. So they're probably good candidates to move forward. So I think that it makes a big difference there. And I think that... I think it was interesting. It definitely was not a, um, I don't want to say it's a rebuke to the mayor, but it kind of is. But it's not not. No, you're right. If if you read the endorsement, it it, it kind of, again, I'm with you on that. I'm not necessarily saying a rebuke, but they're they're suggesting we need a different kind of mayor than we currently have right now is what their purpose in the the endorsement is. They even go so far as to say, if you you want Sly 2.0, you want Jolie Justice. Mm -hmm. And and they, they make that point in the endorsement. But in their explaining of Glenn and Kennedy, they talk about, no, this is we need a different mayor for a different time now. So I don't think it's I think rebuke is not necessarily too hard a word, yeah. but I think that's the vibe of what they're trying to say. Stephen. Yeah, I was uh, I was caught off guard. We just finished taping weekend review and I was beating up Dave Helen because uh, it was a little shocking um, to a, a lot of people in a lot of different circles. Um, it does send a message of, you know, with this transition of the airport and. Kansas City has been had a lot of eyes on it in a lot of different ways. It, they are saying it may be time to shift gears in a not a different direction, but just a different tone, uh, in my opinion. Um, endorsements are interesting. Uh, I mean, I think the informed voter that is voting on Tuesday has already made their mind or that endorsement's not going to change their mind. But to the uninformed voter who's not watching our – uh, chats with the candidates or really doing a deep dive because, like Kat mentioned, there's so many candidates. It's, oh, well, I heard the star sick. Kennedy or Glenn? Oh, I don't care. I'll vote for one of them. Right. Oh, Kennedy's a black person. Or, oh, Glenn is young. Or, you know what I'm saying? Like, No, I think you bring a up lot a great point. People, the fact that they put right. two names out there is, right. is, is, a, is a big thing for people to be able to kind of mm-hmm. even – you have the power of – feeling as if you've been given an extra tool to make your yeah. decision with and also still being able to make your own decision between the two, I think is a really mm-hmm. interesting take on, on on what that endorsement did for the race itself. Yeah, I don't want to, you know, get ahead of myself here, but I, I'm thinking maybe one of the things people might be wondering and maybe you were going to ask us is who do you see coming out of this? Mm. I was not going to ask. Oh, here's, I was like, Cat, why are you? Here's, no, here's the thing, here's the thing. I've been dreading this question. Here's, here's what I was going to do Yeah, uh, <laughs> because I, I hate to pin you both down to, to this, and but I... It's I know fine. you both well enough to know there's no way you can do the jobs you have done without having a strong feeling towards what it looks like. So what I was going to ask was, after doing your reporting and now just a few days out from the election, do you have a strong sense of who you expect to win? So I don't have a strong sense of who well, – I, well, I will say this. I think that – Julie Justice might have the most votes moving okay. out of the primary. But in terms of the people most likely to move forward, I'm going to give you more than just two names. Please do. I'm going to give you people who I think are kind of in this tier of could move forward. And that'd be uh, Julie Justice. Uh, that'd be Alicia Kennedy, Quentin Lucas, and Steve Miller. Okay. So that's four out of the 11. Stephen, any any differences from that? or any? Um, I, I'd that? say Jolie, Quentin, and Phil Glenn. I think the challenge here, and this is kind of our, you know, looking ahead to Tuesday night, you know, because of the the large field, uh, it's kind of like the Republican uh, Mm -hmm. thing back in 2016. Sure. I don't think we're going to see any of these candidates get to like 40%, 50%. Oh, no. 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 And so if we're looking at, you know, you have one, you know, candidate A gets 25%, Mm -hmm. the the margins between these different candidates is going to be incredibly small. Oh, yeah. And so I think that that 
presents the challenge, you know, if we're talking about handicap predicting, you know, you could have a candidate that gets 15% and they're fourth and the, the second place candidate has 17%. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. Uh, obviously, we're going to do further podcasts between now and when the actual mayor is elected. So this will be another thing that we talk about. But I'm curious now, um, based on what Tuesday's results will be, is there any candidate in the race right now that either of you see becoming a strong voice for someone who does get through? Mm. What candidate can you see not making it through the primary Tuesday night Perp. and then it coming out on Wednesday and saying, you know what, I'm going to be this person's backer and being not necessarily yeah. kingmaker, but being a big, big supporter of another candidate in the race? Tech, correct forward. me if I'm wrong. At all the forums and even on social media, you would think Quinn, Quentin and Phil Glenn have this bromance that is just, <laughs> I can really see if like someone like Phil does not make it in the final two, I could see him, let's say Quentin makes it. I could definitely see him throwing his support behind Quentin. I don't, I don't know, and you've talked to them longer than I have in, in this sense with the, the race, but their chemistry is just, I don't, I don't know if it's just cordial or, but. To me, it seems like I they don't know. they click. They, they yeah. the two of them click. Okay, but that could just be just politics. Um, I could see Phil Glenn supporting Quinn. Okay. Well, and I think that Phil Glenn is someone who, you know, this is his first time running for mm-hmm. an office like this, but he's been really involved in the Democratic Party and yeah. has knocked doors for a lot of people. So I think he is someone who, even if he doesn't move forward, will be very active. involved yeah. and mm-hmm. active because he just always has been. Um, What's your answer, Kat? I, I really I don't have an answer. <laughs> I thought this was the Clay Chastain question. Oh, oh there needs to be a Clay Chastain question. Oh, my gosh. Kat, uh, how was your interview in Union Station with Clay Chastain? Well. Well, Clay Chastain talked a lot about why, you know, th- he talked a lot about the fact that he doesn't live here. He lives in Bedford, Virginia. <laughs> I was about to say, if you're not, if you're going, who's Clay Chastain? He is a non-Kansas City resident yes. running for Kansas City mayor. And, you know, well, last, I, th- last time he's going to run. Last time, Allegedly. according to him. And he told me, you know, I asked a lot. I asked, you know, what makes you think, you, you know, you don't live here. How could you be the person to make all of these decisions for the people of Kansas City? And he got very emotional, was was crying um, really? on, a, on a bench in Union Station, talking about how his parents are buried here, and he spent a lot of time here, and what greater connection is there than that? He's been involved as an activist for 30 years. He had to move to Virginia for a job and family reasons, and so uh, it was it was interesting. I will, you know, like him, hate him. He is someone who has been a part of this political scene in Kansas City for a very, very long time. And he's got another petition. So I have two points to make. Uh, one, I, I have not mentioned one of the people who I interviewed, Henry Klein. He's a branch manager um, in, uh, in kind of in the urban core um, in an interesting area. And he's run before. Uh, he's running as the underdog candidate. He has some interesting views, especially one thing that I think is interesting that I haven't heard a lot of candidates talk about. And I don't know if it's just a fight for another day and it's not that sexy, but he talked about um, making KCPD have local police control is still the only police department in the country uh, that the board is appointed by the state, um, which is important in a way if you want a truly local uh, police department. But the point, too, that I was going to make is with the field being so wide, we would be having a totally different conversation if just certain candidates, if the field was maybe six instead of ten or five instead of ten. Phil Glenn may be getting more eyes if someone like a, a, a Wagner and Taylor weren't in or, yeah. you know, just – swap out candidates and so i wonder you know these maybe in our opinion lower tier candidates um how they would do if the fill wasn't as big as it was it's just a it could be a rhetorical question but i just think we'll have we we, we would be having a totally different discussion depending on if yeah. some levers were changed in this do you get any vibe from any of them and i, I they may be mad at you if you answer this question, but Uh-oh. I'm curious. Do you get any vibe from any of them that they don't feel like they have a strong shot to it, like that they, they, they feel like they're running in this maybe to prove a point or to get some different uh, messages out there but don't feel like they have a really strong shot? Well, one thing that I find really interesting, and I don't think that this necessarily implies that he doesn't think he has a shot, but I was looking at some of the campaign finance and how much money the candidates have spent. Yes. And mm-hmm. I think maybe this could be just him waiting until mm-hmm. the final mm-hmm. week, but – Eight days out from the election, it showed that in the past reporting period, Jermaine Reed had only spent seventeen hundred dollars right. and had a hundred thousand cash on hand. Right. And so I don't know. I haven't seen some proliferation of all of right. these ads and things from yeah. Jermaine. So 
I don't really yeah, know. Yeah, I don't if that's know if it's a final blitz. And he was one of the candidates I interviewed. I mean, you know, he has a one thing I will say, all of these candidates have some really unique backgrounds that you usually don't get in a in a in a good sized city like Kansas City's race. I mean, two candidates who used to be homeless and just a, yeah. a lot of things. And um with Jermaine, it has been interesting because when you said the email with the finances, I mean, he has a couple of billboards around, you know, Jolie, every time you click a dog on web video, and there's an something, ad, yeah. and, you know, yeah. things like that. And, and she spent the most money of anybody in the race. Also. Yeah, right. Her she and spent, Miller. Her and Miller. Yeah. And I feel like the people who you see the most ads for, like, I can't get away from them online, mm-hmm. are Quentin, Jolie, yeah. and then Steve Miller. Everywhere. And so maybe, everywhere. maybe, I mean... We've been talking about this forever, but voters have not been thinking about this forever. So maybe right. Jermaine is going to do some huge blitz from That's a know, point. S- Sunday to Tuesday. We don't know because uh, he does have a lot of money and he's term limited. So where's the, you know. That's a good point. What are you doing? We'll see. <laughs> okay. So uh, unless Sam has something, the last question, I did you have something else you wanted to ask? Because I've only got one more. So I, I want to talk about Tuesday night and voting trends. Okay. So we learned a couple of things, I think, from the 2018 elections as it related to uh, women candidates, the, uh, mm-hmm. the proliferation of those, um, you know, kind of a, a little bit of a feel maybe of some, some you know, insurgent slash candidates who maybe didn't necessarily have a traditional political background. Um, you know, I think we saw that with Sharice here in our, in our local community. <laughs> President Trump. <laughs> right. It's a couple yeah, years it's, ago. It's a, it's a trend, yeah. Um, this, these are obviously nonpartisan election, but do you guys have a feel of if, any of those trends that we've seen in the last couple of elections might apply here. Uh, I, Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, so I think that it's interesting looking at the race. I think that if one of the candidates who emerges from the primary is a woman, I think that that will be kind of a, a rallying uh, thing moving forward. And I think especially having Jolie would be the first openly LGBTQ mm-hmm. mayor of Kansas City. And I think that that's something, you know, I had seen her even featured in a national yeah. like, publication about that. So I think we could see a lot of support there. Or Alicia Kennedy would be mm-hmm. the first black, black yeah, woman, mm-hmm. you know. And so I think that you could see those trends pick up after the primary right. if, if a woman moves through. Yeah. But I think the, the voting population for this is just a little bit different than in it's general. Totally, totally so, different. I mean, it's yeah. April – it's just a weird time, and so I don't think like the 2018 November momentum will mm-hmm. be the same. Uh, definitely in the the general, it probably would be that. And I hope she doesn't get mad at me, but Kat and I have been talking about what if Kennedy Justice. I mean, I think that would man, that would be, be crazy. very interesting. You're saying if the two of them get out of the primary, yes. yeah, that'd be a really oh, interesting that, race, man. I, that, that'd be interesting. Okay, so here's here's my last question for you guys. And who, who, who do you think is going to be in the final two? We're turning on you. I I don't know. You're I, here. I really uh, I you know because I'm not a Kansas City right? resident, so I don't get the the blitz of ads and that kind of thing. I I will be. I th- I think there are some that will surprise me just be, just mm-hmm. based on watching your reporting and what we've been able to cover. So that's what I want to ask you going forward. This last question. One first part. Where will you be if you know where you're going to be on Tuesday night? Where what part of what story are you well, covering? We are, gonna, we are, um, we're floating. We're figuring yeah, out where you're going to be. Because there's so many, a lot of the parties are close to each other. So okay. we will you be. You may move from room to room. Yeah. We'll be hopping and watching results come in. Okay. And kind of seeing how the results are going. And that will determine the final right. location. So the question I have for both of you, let's take Chastain out of this mm-hmm. particular question, because I think that would be an obvious answer here. But what will is there anything that will shock you on Tuesday night if it happens? If someone doesn't make the, the the final two or if someone does, what would most shock you if it happened on Tuesday night? I think Jolie not moving forward. Jolie not moving shocking. for the final two. Yeah, yeah. That would shock me. And then, um, let me choose my words wisely. Um, I think if Jermaine Reed is in a very low number, that will um, be interesting. Not shocking. Not necessarily if he doesn't just, make it out, but if he's just at a low he, turnout. If he's like... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it also, I think it would st- be very surprising if Phil Glenn moved forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even, even with I, the endorsement from the paper. Yeah, and right. I think a lot of people right. like Phil Glenn a lot, especially after seeing him, but, you know, the name recognition right. issue. I think it would be really interesting. Because yeah. I think when people meet him, they like him. Yeah. But um, we were chatting, like, I'm not seeing the, the social media, not saying he's not doing it, mm-hmm. but I'm not seeing the... The same like social media blitz or trying to attract young people or, or right. 
but he's been doing a lot of door knocking. Right. So I think looking and the at the ground game. Ground yeah. game. Yeah. So who what pays off in the end? Mm-hmm. You know, is it the social media ads? Is is it and I know and I'm, you know, saying what I've seen also on social media. Um oh sorry, I just I got a Twitter notification. No, I you're apologize. Fine. Was fine. it breaking news? Um, no, I just oh, okay. wasn't sure what it was about. Um, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, back to what I was going to say. I think we'll see. You know, a lot of candidates have been hitting the ground game pretty hard. I think you see Quentin Lucas is, like, constantly knocking doors yes. and posting a million things and Phil Glenn. And so will those door knocks pay off? Will it be money that wins? Yeah. We'll see. I think my shocking, to answer your question, not necessarily specific on people, I would be shocked if the final two candidates are not both council members. That that would surprise mm-hmm. me. Okay. I, okay. I expect the final two candidates to both be sitting on the current city council. That's that's from from watching what I've seen, that's what would surprise me. What Sam, about you, Sam? Anything? When is when do we get the the referendum on Mayor Sly James? Does that come next Tuesday or does that come in June? As, <laughs> as it relates to I get what you're saying. Are, uh. Is the public oh. willing to continue with as I the think, star put it in their uh, I, endorsement, James two point or is the voting public ready to try something different? I think to what Kat just said there, I think if Jolie somehow does not make it into the final two, I think that that's answers the answer, your question. Right. I think that's the answer Tells to your you question. If, if she does, then we'll, then I think we do have to wait until June. So really quick in that, in that respect is usually getting an endorsement from the sitting mayor is, is a big deal. And, you know, say what you want about his style, but, you know, James has been a cheerleader for the town, and I think he gets high marks for that. Sure. Um, that would generally be a positive endorsement. But in this particular case, you could argue that that, that is a weight. Uh, I don't think Jolie. Jolie – if Jolie loses, I don't think it's because Sly James endorsed her. Okay. Right. Like, I, I I just think she might not – she just may be a vanilla candidate. Not okay. vanilla as in race, vanilla as in – She's not saying anything. Not dynamic that's enough, necessarily. To, yeah. Okay. I don't think her connections to Sly, just just my opinion, will make her lose. Okay. Or w- if she loses, it won't be because of Sly. Okay. Thank you for the clarification on yeah. race. Right. I appreciate it. The vanilla part. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want people to think I'm talking about race. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, guys, we can't thank you enough for taking the time and just for doing the work. And really, I, I know it's a lot to ask for viewers sometimes because we've got a million things going on. But if you have the time, go and just watch, just pick one candidate that you've never heard of and listen to something they have to say. Because some of the work, uh, all the work that Kat and Stephen did and the photographers and the editors and Sam put together, it's incredible journalism done. Uh, journalism with a capital J, as I like to say, with, with some of those instances. Um, so really take some time if you can this weekend. Grab an hour when your kids are napping uh, and go listen to at least one of these interviews because it's it's worth your time to, to learn more about it uh, and to be a more informed Kansas City voter. Thanks so much for listening to 41 Files. Uh, we will be back next week with a post-election edition. Mm, and the day, the, the, the morning. The day after the election, yeah. we will be on for 41 Files. So we will have uh, a lot of a lot of more politi- a lot more political talk to talk about and maybe some shocking things to talk about based mm. on what we just said. Thanks for joining us. See ya.